The paediatric assessment triangle helps pre-hospital providers make a quick, simple and smooth assessment of children. And um, what it's asking is, is this child sick or aren't they sick? The beautiful thing about the paediatric assessment triangle is that it allows this assessment without using any equipment and without even touching the child. And here's how we do it. The first thing to note is that the paediatric assessment triangle is not a diagnostic tool. What it's doing is allowing a way to make a quick assessment and overview of how unwell the child is and that will help you make a decision about how urgently the child needs to have management implemented. The triangle is made up of three components, three sides of a triangle and the three components are appearance, breathing and circulation. You assess each of these three areas in turn and you decide is the child sick or not sick in that area and then you put all three areas together at the end and you get an overall impression. The first area in the paediatric assessment triangle is appearance. Here you get an overall appearance of what the child looks like and we use the tickles mnemonic to help make this assessment. T in tickles is for tone. Have a look at the child and you can see are they appropriately moving around or are they lying on the bed not able to lift up their arms. That's going to give you an idea of the tone. When you uh, go near them or a parent picks them up, do they move, do they resist movement or are they just floppy and going with it? So the question we're asking for tone is, is the child moving around normally or are they floppy or listless? I in tickles is for interactiveness. Here you need to assess the interactiveness based on the appropriateness for the developmental stage of the child. So babies will be able to smile around six weeks, they should be looking around and as they get older they start to fix and follow. So when you see a child you want to know are they looking around, do they, or they look at you when you walk in the room, are they looking and interacting with the parent, are they following you as you walk around and is that appropriate for the developmental age. So the questions we're asking here is how alert is the child? Are they watching and looking at you appropriately? C is for consolability. Now we all know that children cry all the time. They cry for lots of reasons because you want them to go to bed, because you want them to get up, because you won't let them play with that toy. So there's many, many reasons why children cry, but most children should be able to be consoled by their caregiver. So if you find a situation where the child seems like completely unable to be settled, even in spite of their parent or caregiver trying to settle them, then that seems like something's a bit off. Also, you might want to think about how they respond to you. When you come into the room, they should recognize that you're a stranger they might react like they don't want to talk to you and that's very normal it's also important to know is their reaction to their parent different from their reaction to you they know their parent they don't know you so it's appropriate that there would be a different reaction so the question we're asking here is can this child be comforted by their caregiver the l in tickles is for look or gaze this is looking at how is the child observing what's going on around them. So are they just staring blankly at a wall or into space? Or are they making eye contact with the parent? Do they notice when you come in the room and move around to look at you? If there was another object or something moving around the room, would they be able to watch and follow it? So the question you're asking here is, are they looking at their caregiver or you, or are they staring blankly into the distance? The S in tickles is for speech or cry. So we've already discussed how commonly children cry, and crying is usually fine as long as it's not your child, and as long as they're consolable, which we've already discussed. But what we're looking at with speech and cry is, does it sound normal? So a high pitched cry or a hoarse cry might suggest that there's something else going on. So here you're gonna be asking the parents, do they sound like they're speaking or crying like they normally do? Or is there something you've noticed that's unusual? And remember, it's very normal for a child to cry when a stranger is near them or trying to talk to them. That's very appropriate. If they're not moving or responding to having a stranger nearby, then that may be a red flag. So what we're asking here is, do they have a strong, vigorous cry or are they weak or hoarse? That's the tickles mnemonic that helps you assess the appearance of the child. And at the end of that assessment, we're gonna be asking, are we worried about the appearance of this child or not? Next up, we're going to breathing. So this section of the paediatric assessment triangle is actually looking at the respiratory status of the child and whether or not we're worried about it. Specifically here, we're looking at how much work or effort the child is having to make to oxygenate or ventilate themselves. We're gonna look at position here. What position is the child sitting in? Because when some children have an airway obstruction or a problem with flow, they try to change their position to optimize the airway diameter and the airway flow. Sometimes they do this by extending their neck up. So they extend their neck to try and open the airway more. Sometimes they do 
this by what's called tripoding, and that's where they position themselves, leaning forward on the bed, and they put their hands on the bed, so they've got a kind of tripod position. Both of these are red flags for respiratory distress, so the position is really important. Nasal flaring is the next thing to check for. So here we're looking at, are the nostrils flaring, so opening more in and out with each breath? They do this to try and increase and improve the ventilation. So the body's putting in more work of breathing to try and maintain adequate ventilation. This can be really difficult to see on first glance, so you have to be specifically looking for it to be able to notice. Tracheal tug is a pretty easy one to see. You need to look straight at the trachea to see if it's drawing in and out with each breath. Once you have a look, it's easy to spot and it's a sign that there's increased work of breathing. Intercostal and subcostal recession are a really important sign of respiratory distress. What we're seeing here is drawing in in between the ribs or under the ribs when the child is breathing in and out. This is because the child's needing to make extra effort in breathing in order to maintain their ventilation. Sometimes, younger babies, they can have a normal pattern of what's called periodic breathing, where it seems like the breathing goes faster and then slower. And sometimes it can be difficult to know in babies if what you're seeing is normal breathing for them or not. And the best way to work this out is just to ask the parents, does the breathing look normal for them to you? Head bobbing is another really important one to look out for. This is more common in younger children and it is literally that their head is bobbing up and down with each breath. Uh, again, at the beginning, it can sometimes just look like they're moving around, but if you're looking for this specifically, you will see that the head is bobbing with every breath and it's a sign of increased work of breathing. Runting is a really important sign to look out for. This is a noise that the child makes with every breath. And again, another one that's really easy to miss because sometimes it can sound like the child's just crying a bit or making odd noises. But if you listen and you realize that this is a noise with every breath, then that's grunting and it's a worry because what it is is the child trying to breathe against a closed glottis and that's a big red flag. There's other noises that you might hear when you're listening to a child breathe. You might hear wheeze, you might hear strider, you might hear snoring. And each of these noises, if you can identify the type of the noise, it can help point you to what the underlying diagnosis is likely to be. But grunting and strider are definitely big red flags. And finally, abdominal breathing is an important sign of respiratory distress. By this, I mean when you look at a child and they've got abdominal breathing, it looks like their abdomen is doing most of the work of breathing rather than the chest, and this is just a marker of how much effort it's taking to maintain their ventilation. All of these together make the assessment triangle arm of breathing. So here we're saying, are we worried about the child's breathing or not? Circulation is the third arm of the paediatric assessment triangle. This in some ways is the trickiest one to assess and you can miss subtle signs of a circulatory problem if you don't get a proper look at the child. So if you haven't already, you really need to get the child properly undressed at this point to be able to make a good circulation assessment. As part of circulation, you might want to do capillary refill time. It's technically not part of the paediatric assessment triangle because it's a no touch technique, but you, it may be something you want to check with circulation. When we're looking at their circulation, one of the things we're looking for is pallor. So this means is does the child look paler than normal? And remember, pallor looks different on different skin tones. So what you want to know is not does the child look pale to you, but does the child look pale for them? And you're going to know that by asking the parents, do they look a normal colour or not and why? When you're looking for pallor, it's also helpful to look in the mucous membranes as sometimes they can give you a bit easier identifying signs. Next, you're looking for mottling. Mottling is a patchy discoloration of the skin and it's caused by variable vasoconstriction. It's common at the extremities but sometimes it can affect the whole body and that is a sign of impaired perfusion and should really be a red flag to you. And next we've got cyanosis. This is where you get a bluish discoloration of the skin. It's most common around the mouth and it's more common on the fingertips or toes. It's a big red flag for hypoxia. Now all of these signs, pallor, mottling, cyanosis, they can occur in the context of a fever in children but you don't know at this stage what the cause is. So what you want to know is, is there signs of circulation that you're worried about, yes or no? And you can worry later about whether it was just related to fever or just related to something else. But at this point in the assessment, you have to take these signs seriously. Now we've done our assessment, we've got all three areas assessed, appearance, breathing and circulation, and we put them all together to work out how worried we are about the child and then what might be wrong with them. If you've got an abnormal finding in any of these areas, there is a problem with the child and they're likely to need some intervention. And remember, what we're broadly trying to do here with the paediatric assessment triangle is work out, are they sick or not sick? Are they stable or unstable? So now we've got the basics, what we need to do is to, to recognise that we put the arms of the paediatric assessment triangle together to put the child into one of five broad categories as to what might be causing the problem. Category one, a child with breathing signs only, 
is considered to be in respiratory distress. A child with breathing signs and appearance signs is considered to be in respiratory failure. A child with appearance signs and circulation signs is considered to be in shock. A child with appearance signs only would be considered to have a neurological problem or a metabolic problem. And a child with signs in all three areas would be considered to have cardiorespiratory failure or decompensated shock. So these are obviously broad categories, but they follow logically. They're very easy to make the assessment and mean that you will follow a sense plan. So you take your paediatric assessment, you work out which arms of the triangle have a problem and you put them together to then work out which category the child falls into. And you're going to direct initial management based on what broad category the child falls into. So if you've got a patient in respiratory distress, you're going to put them in a comfortable position, you're going to give them oxygen and you're going to implement any specific uh, management strategies that you might need depending on the cause in that child. So if it was asthma, you might give salbutamol or if it was croup you might give steroids. If the child's in respiratory failure you're going to position the head and airway, you're going to apply 100% oxygen, you're going to get your bag mask ventilation ready, you're going to remove any foreign objects in the airway and you're going to start to prepare for a definitive airway. If the patient is in the shock category you're going to give oxygen, try to get access whether that's IV or IO, you're going to give them fluid management and then you're going to think about any specific management interventions that they will need depending on what you know about the cause of the shock. If the child's in the neurological or metabolic category, you're going to check a blood sugar and you're going to apply oxygen if needed. If the child is in cardiorespiratory failure or decompensated shock, you're going to position the airway, you're going to use bag mask ventilation, you will start chest compressions if they need it and you'll implement any specific therapy depending on what you know about the cause of the current presentation. So broadly, the paediatric assessment tool is an amazing tool with a no-touch technique that can get you a quick and accurate assessment of whether you're worried about a child or not. If you enjoyed this video, you'll enjoy my video on how to position a child optimally for cannula insertion, which you can see here.